Good morning. <laughs> so, like Brad was saying, um, uh, along with vocational ministry and having a passion to pursue it, right now I am the, um, the lead of children's ministry here uh, at Journey Bellevue. Um, it's something that I got into when we made this move over here to Bellevue and starting the church. Um, it, it, I thought it was a great place for me to get my feet in the door and, and really start learning what goes on. It gives me opportunities to practice sermon preps every week with Brad. Um, and along with that, I'm also a husband, my husband to my beautiful wife, Heidi. Um, we have three kids together, so I'm a father of three. Like Brad was saying, um, I've got a day job and a night job because I work days and nights every 10 weeks. It switches, and it's about 60 hours a week. And like you were saying, on top of that, I'm also pursuing vocational ministry. So there's a lot going on, but it's, it's exciting. And so a little bit about me that you know now, a little bit what we're going to be getting into today is that I think it's so easy for all of us to agree that we can agree that it's easy to adore and worship God when everything is going smooth. Um, when, when, you, when life's easy, it, it's easy to look to the stars and look to the sky and say, man, thank you, God, for making this run so easy. You know, you're excited about it. But what happens when no one's seen or heard from God in years? Or what happens when your path isn't so easy? What happens when the walk's not the way you expect it to be? Can you still adore and worship God when the path isn't so easy? See, I have this hunch that we've all been to this point in our life where we're eagerly pursuing God. You know, we're looking for him. We're, we're doing everything that we think we can to pursue him, and what we're getting in return is silence. See, we long for his activity in our life. We're, we're looking for his plan. We're looking for his peace, and what we get is silence. And if we're being honest with each other and how that affects our relationship with God, I think it makes us feel uneasy. It makes us feel uncertain. And in an attempt to explain that uncertainty today, I'd like to get into my story a little bit more and how like this, this exact situation is playing out in my life right now. Um, see, about, I'd say like two years ago, I was, I, I had this like eureka moment or like light bulb moment where I finally decided, like, I realized what I wanted to do, like on this planet with my time here, I realized what I wanted to do. And I realized this because it was a couple years back and I'm, I'm reading my Bible and I'm going through my Bible and, you know, I'm, I'm highlighting things that I think are important. You know, the verses that are standing out to me. And, you know, for people that follow Jesus, it's not uncommon to go through your Bible and, you know, highlight things that you think are important. But what seemed different to me was when I was highlighting these verses, these verses seemed like they had a story that was just trapped inside these verses that was just dying to be told. So I would highlight these verses, and then I would write these stories that went along with these verses, what I thought needed to be told from these verses. And I would do this, and it still felt like something was incomplete, like I was missing something. And at that time, I was in a couple of, like, men's Bible groups, Bible studies, and I was explaining to them how I was, I was highlighting these verses, I'm writing these stories, and I, I still just feel like something's missing. And they started to bring to my attention, well, well, maybe these stories aren't just to build your own faith. Maybe these stories are to build others' faith. And, you know, so I started thinking about that, and, and then that's when this light bulb really started turning on. I'm like, well, maybe these are, these stories are to build other people's faith, and maybe these stories are sermons. So then I, I changed my approach from writing these stories. I started writing these stories like I was writing a sermon, like I was building up to start telling these stories as a sermon, like I was going to be a pastor. So in my mind that day, I decided, oh, I'm going to be a pastor. Just like that, I'm, I'm going to be a pastor. I, I'm right here, this day forward, I'm going to be a pastor. But <laughs> the problem with that is, how do you become a pastor? I don't know how to become a pastor. You know, I, I have no idea. Uh, who does the hiring and firing? It's not like going and putting an application in, is it? Like, I, am I educated enough? You know, there's a million questions that I start asking. Do you have to go to ministry school 
you know, what are the ins and outs of becoming a pastor? And in a sense of being honest and being open and, and hoping to relate on, on this silence and how it makes us feel, you know, the biggest problem that I had was the biggest hurdle that I was going to have to overcome for being a pastor was before I was saved, I was insanely selfish when it came to money. And I was all, all, all I worried about was all the things that had nothing to do with in eternity. All the things that meant so much to me had nothing to do with eternity. So it was always the, the bigger house, the nicer car, the, the latest and greatest of everything. And what that got me was a lot of debt. And although I could afford this debt, I surely couldn't afford to start going to ministry school or quit my job and pursue ministry or take a, a step back and take a pay cut to afford ministry, to, to become a minister or try to pursue vocational ministry. So when, when I realized this, you know, um, I'm thinking, but surely if God has called me to be a pastor, surely if I'm supposed to be a minister, well, God's going to open these doors for me, and he's going to open them right now. And, you know, maybe, just maybe, someone's just going to start paying all my bills. <laughs> and then on top of that, they're also going to send me to ministry school. I don't know. That, that hasn't happened yet. If anyone, any takers, feel free. But so I don't know what happened, but I, I, something in me thought something was going to happen that day. Uh, something was going to happen that month, and surely something was going to happen that year. But time moves on. I'm still driving a forklift. Now, opportunities have opened, but not the way that I expected them to open. So there's been plenty of times over the past couple of years where I've prayed to God for the easy way out. I want that awesome job that I could get right now that digs me out of debt next year. Or I want that amazing ministry job that pays my bills and I can, I can be a minister and I can also pay for the bad decisions of my past. But it just, that, that easy way out isn't reasonable. And so as I'm praying this stuff, what I got in return from God was silence. And in that silence, it gave me time to think about maybe what I should really be praying for. And I shouldn't be praying for this easy way out. But instead, now I'm praying to always have patience and never lose passion pursuing God's plan. Everyone can say that with me. <laughs> to always have patience and never lose passion pursuing God's plan. See, I think that there's going to be a light at the end of my tunnel. I think eventually God's going to grant me the financial freedom to eventually pursue vocational ministry at a full-time level. And until then, I want to just p passionately pursue this goal. And when I, when I think of my story, it reminds me of a story from the book of Luke. In the book of Luke, there's this man named L Simeon. And he was alive in this period called the 400 years of silence. And this is the period in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And his land of Israel had been overrun by foreign powers for, for years. And, and many people of Israel, you know, they, they question, you know, where is God? You know, how, how is he letting these other countries, these other territories just take us over and, and just treat us so poorly? And, you know, where is he? Are we ever going to hear from God again? And, and, and they just get silence. And the, the difference between all these people and, and their doubts in, and Simeon is, is Simeon was called, he knew that he was going to hear from God. He didn't know when, but he knew he was going to hear, hear from him. So as Simeon's waiting to hear from him, he waited eagerly. He didn't just, you know, sit with his hands underneath himself, just waiting around. No, he waited eagerly. He prayed passionately. He, he knew the consolation of Israel was going to happen. See, something in him knew that there was something terribly wrong with the world he was living in. But he also knew that God was going to do something about it. So, in the midst of the silence, I need to wait on God 
with expectation. See, even when the outside world looks rough, even when your bills are piling up, even when sickness overtakes your body, even if addiction has its grasp on you, you have to fix your eyes on what is unseen rather than what's seen. You need to have patience in God's plan. And you need to have a passion to pursue God's plan. We need to take the route that Simeon did and be confident that God is going to deliver. In the midst of the silence, I need to wait on God with expectation. So 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 says, That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our eyes on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. So in the midst of this silence, I need to keep doing the right thing. Simeon waited patiently. He prayed passionately. He kept doing the right thing. In this same section of Luke, it mentions another person that was patiently waiting for the return of God. Her name was Anna, and Scripture lets us know that she never left the temple. She stayed there day and night, praying, worshiping, fasting, just staying dedicated to this, this end goal that God is going to console the, the nation that they're living in, that he's going to come, he's going to save them, he's going he's gonna to come through. And I think about these two people, Simeon and Anna, and I think about the endless prayers that they might have sent up. You know, we don't know if it was a year. We don't know if it was a month. We don't know if it was five years. But how many prayers did they send up and receive silence? How many times could they have just, you know, packed their bags and be like, you know what, maybe it's not going to happen. You know, I don't, I don't know if he's going to come through. It's been a while now. I've been praying these same prayers. You know, is he going to show up or not? But they kept praying. They were confident that the Lord was going to come through because in the midst of the silence, I need to do the right thing. And not only that, in the midst of the silence, I also need to keep looking for Jesus. You see, all these prayers that Simeon and Anna were sending up, they weren't in vain. Later in the story, it shows us that the Spirit had led Simeon to the temple. And what Simeon didn't know at the time was that there was a couple that was going to come dedicate their new baby that day. See, law back then, if you had a, a new boy, uh, it, was, it was law to dedicate two turtle doves at the temple uh, to the Lord. Like, much like if you show up, you have a kid now, you show up to the courthouse or, or the you know, state place, you get your birth certificate. That's all they're doing. You know, they're just showing up to do what they're supposed to do. And as they show up, much to these people's surprise, Simeon was there, he saw the child, he took him in his arms and praised God. Luke 2.29 says, Sovereign Lord, now you can let your servant die in peace as you promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. If you skip ahead to verse 38, Anna is also in the temple that day because she never left day or night. And Luke 2.38 says, She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph. She began praising God. She talked about the child with everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. You see, Simeon and Anna, they didn't know that the Messiah was going to be at the temple that day. But what they did do was trust in God and that he was going to come through. So when God put the new Messiah, the Savior, in front of them, they recognized him. And they recognized him because of their endless hours of worship, because of their deep relationship with God is the reason they, they recognized him. They never lacked patience in the plan. 
and they always had a passion to pursue God. And when I think about Simeon surprising Mary and Joseph with, you know, the, that image in my mind of you're just coming to pick up the birth certificate and someone grabs your kid and is praising God and just thrilled with how th- this, this, is the, this is the guy, this is our Savior. We're, we're so thrilled. And I think about our daily walk in life as Christians and how the, our daily routine could change someone's eternity forever. And, and to stay focused on, on doing what's right, stay focused on living the Christian life to the fullest, to, to following Jesus to the fullest, because our everyday routine could change someone's eternity. We could surprise someone with God's love and change their eternity forever. And that's just something that's just so humbling, and I just, if we could all think about that and, and make it an opportunity, you know, make it a challenge to, to, to be in that situation, to be in that state, to surprise someone with God's love. So my question for you is, can we remain in a state of adoration for God in moments of silence? When things aren't going that well, can you still thank him? Will you still worship in times of sorrow, in times of burden? You see, I believe our God's faithful. And I believe that if you give him your heart, he'll give you his. I believe that he's never going to give up on you, and you just have to stay consistent. You have to stay consistent with this plan. Stay consistent in your faith. And, and, and when things don't go exactly as you plan, you, you just can't give up on him. You can't give up on him too quick. You know, the, the way the story says about Simeon and Anna, you know, it, it seems like, you know, it doesn't give us an exact time, but it, it seems like there's a, a vast amount of time that's covered, you know, that they're waiting, and they're waiting patiently, and, and they're waiting, you know, passionately. And if things just aren't going exactly how you think they're going to, you know, I think that we just need to stay dedicated. We need to know what the end game is. We need to know that it affects our eternity. So if we could... Bow our heads. I would just like to thank you, Father. I would like to thank you so much for how faithful you are. I would like to pray for you to give us patience, to remind us of your good nature, even in times of silence, and let that reminder give us comfort. May we always have a passion to pursue you, and whatever it is, that you have in store for our lives. And if we could just remain in a state of prayer for a moment. So if if you're here today and you're thinking to yourself, this guy keeps talking about this plan and I don't even know if God is part of my plan at all. Or you don't even know how to make God part of your plan. Well, because of this amazing gift of Jesus Christ, this, this little baby that Mary and Joseph came to dedicate to the Lord, this little baby, he grew to become a man. And this man was the son of God. He went on to live a sinless life. He was later killed on the cross to die for our sins. He rose from the dead three days later to prove that he was no normal man, but indeed the son of God. He took our punishment to let us spend an eternity alongside him in heaven. If that was you today, with everyone's head bowed, everyone's eyes closed, if you could just lift your hand for me quickly. If that's you today, if you want to repeat this prayer with me, thank you, Father, for eternal life. Please forgive me for all my past sins. From this day forward, I will strive to live a life that mirrors your son, Jesus. I believe you sent your son, Jesus, to earth to live a sinless life he died and rose again for me please stand with me in this journey as I begin to follow you amen